Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. Thank you for all that you bring forth this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on the subject of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the beginning of the church age and the work that God purposes to accomplish and has been doing through the church age. We talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit has work in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. We talked about the fact of how we are to be led by the Holy Spirit, how we're to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, and the results of hearing and obeying as we obey or if we disobey the voice of the Lord. We've also talked about understanding the anointing of God and how it operates in our life and how it is to function as we do the things to cause that to come forth in our life. Well, today we're going to talk about the subject of rivers of living water in the end time glorious church. And this is talking about how the Holy Spirit will be released and manifest through the church in these last days. John chapter 7, verse 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink goes on and says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake ye of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. This is talking about the Holy Spirit. Of course, at this point in time, Jesus had not been glorified. But notice the Holy Spirit is received by those who are believers and it's important that you understand the receiving of the Holy Spirit is subsequent to salvation. Now he starts out here and he's talking about the last day, the great day of the feast, where he stands up and declares this. The feast that he's speaking of is the Feast of Tabernacles. And he's saying, if any man thirst, the King James says, come unto me. But really what this is saying is, this is a commanding statement in the Greek because it is an imperative mood. And it's a present tense. It's literally saying, be coming unto me continually. It's a command unto the body of Christ. And when he says drink, it's the same thing. It is also a present tense, imperative mood, a commanding statement. This means, and present tense is ongoing action. This means, he's saying, if any man thirst, be coming unto me and be drinking continually. He's commanding that. So you and I are to come to him or to be drinking something in, which is his word, in order to see him accomplish the things that he wants in our life. Because what happens as you drink in the things of God? He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, that's the inner man on the inside of you, shall flow rivers of living water. That's what's supposed to come out of you because of God on the inside of you. You need to get the river of God in you, which comes through the Word of God. And God is coming into the body of Christ, the remnant who are listening to Him, and are going to be seeing the rivers of living water flowing out of the body of Christ in these last days. Now this is talking about tabernacles here because we go back to the beginning of this chapter and we see in verse 2, now the feast, Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And this time of tabernacles was customarily called the drawing out of the water. And that is significant because the outpouring of the waters, the flow of the rivers of waters are to come forth out of us. It's important to understand. We come to verse 6. This is when they were talking about him going to that feast at that time. And Jesus said unto them, My time, this is his fixed and definite time. This word, kairos, means the fixed and definite time is not yet come. But your time is always ready. Speaking to us, our time is always ready to go in to experience all that is to be brought forth in the personal fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles in our life. He goes on up to verse 8. He says, Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet fully come. It's not been fulfilled yet. 
So here, you and I are, can go up into this <coughs> to experience what God wants, to accomplish this great work in our life, the fulfillment of all what the feasts of the Lord are about, which is Jesus Christ coming into us and accomplishing his full work to bring us to perfection, to bring us to uh, for tr tremendous fruitfulness and maturity in the Lord. He goes on now to verse 10. When his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Now, remember Jesus said it wasn't his time yet to come up. So this speaks of Jesus there prophetically of coming to the church in the end time. End time manifestation when his time will be right. And he says, not openly, but as it were in secret. Many are people are looking for a great open wide revival. It's not going to happen. He's coming secretly. He's coming to every church. He's coming to every individual. He's coming to every person to find out whether you're going to be a part of the remnant or going to walk in the ways of the Lord. He doesn't come openly, it says, at this time when he's coming, but instead he's coming, as it says, in secret. So he'll come to the end time church as in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? Why did the Jews want to get him? Because they wanted to kill him. They wanted to destroy him. You know, they were after him. The Jews were the religious people that rejected him. You must understand that there is going to be a group of people that will not walk in the ways of the Lord in the end times. It talks about those that will fall away. But there is a remnant who will follow him. And the, rem the ones who do not walk in the ways of the Lord will persecute the ones who are following the way of the Lord. This is the type of the religious people who will reject the mighty move of the God that is coming in the end time church, the glorious church that will be raised up before the end comes. Verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Midst means the middle. That's what this word means. The middle of the feast. So in the middle of the feast, midway, that indicates the fact that as this work is happening in the body of Christ, Jesus is going to really manifest him powerfully, not right away, but it's going to be in the midst of this going forth. And this is the work of God accomplished in the end time church. One thing we see in the church, the doctrine has been not in line with the word of God. We see too much false teaching, false prophets, teachings of all kinds that are contrary to the Word of God on subject after subject. That is not going to continue when Jesus starts to manifest himself as he will. He goes on to verse 16. He said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. As he's coming now in the midst of the church. We go back to here. It says, When he came in the midst of the church, he went in the temple and he taught. Who's the temple? You and I are the temple. He's coming into us to teach us the truth of the Word of God, to bring revelation to us. And again, he said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. The true doctrine he is bringing forth to the body of Christ, as we are hearing the true Word of God. Then it's an interesting statement he makes in verse 17. If any man will do his will, you kind of lose it a little bit because the word will here is the main verb in this clause. It is a present tense verb, meaning if he continually wills, but it is also in the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood in the Greek expresses things that are contrary to fact. It is expressing things that are conditional upon conditions being met. So this is saying, if any man may be willing continuously, he has to meet those conditions because it's present tense, do is an infinitive here in the Greek. As you can see, infinitive, the way you translate infinitive it would be to do. This is why Young's, the one below it, does such an outstanding job. If anyone may be willing continuously, because it's present tense, to be doing continuously his will. Otherwise, that's the way you have to be if you're going to get true revelation. It says... He shall know concerning the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I do speak for myself. 
In other wise, other words, you cannot approach God's word just kind of being a spectator and thinking about it and think you're going to get revelation. It's not going to work. Only those who are set their will to be doing what they hear to act upon it will get the revelation. And that is important to understand. This is a scriptural principle that was already declared earlier in John, in John chapter 3, verse 21. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. Not just one who hears truth, but the one who is doing truth. And again, this is the present tense. Ongoing, continuous action of truth. That's the one who comes to the light. So you and I must be willing to do the word continually to know the true doctrine, as he said, whether it's truly of the Lord or not, whether it's of God or whether someone's just speaking to themselves. There's a lot of people that are speaking to themselves. They're not speaking things that are true. They're not speaking things that are in line with the word of God. We have all kinds of problems in the body of Christ in the teaching, but God is going to bring the true, true doctrine forth before the end. Verse 18, he that speaketh of himself seeks his own glory. That means anybody that's up there talking about themselves. What do we hear going on in many churches today? They're talking about themselves. They're talking about their accomplishments. They're talking about what they've done. They're talking about all these things. Is that good? No. He that speaks of himself seeks his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Because what's he going to speak of? The word. He's going to bring forth the word. He's not going to be speaking things of himself. This is why you never hear me talk about myself. You don't hear me talk about jokes. You don't hear me talk about things that, you know, we talk about the word. We bring scripture after scripture, point after point, because we need to be taught the truth. It says that one will be true. No, righteousness is in him. This is what we must be doing. So we can't be speaking from ourselves. We must be seeking his glory. And that's, of course, because we're bringing forth the word and also we have to have the walk. We've got to be walking in line with the word as well. We come down to verse 28. Then Jesus cried in the temple as he taught. And who's the temple? You and I are today. And what is he doing? He's coming to teach the true word to those who will listen, who will be attentive to the word and in the word, saying, you both know me and you know whence, which means from where I am. And I'm not come of myself, but he that set me is true, whom you know not. Here, so he says as he's teaching, you know me. That means the fact that we were come to a personal, intimate fellowship with him. When it talks about know, this is a perfect tense verb. The perfect tense is a tense that describes action completed in the past with present effects at the time speaking. Meaning, you essentially, you have known me, as Young's brings forth. How did we get to that place? Because we've heard his word in the past and done it, and it's continued in our life, become our lifestyle. We have revelation, we're walking in his ways, and it's effect in effect at the present time. Otherwise, this shows the ongoing work of the Lord, bringing you to the place of personally knowing him. And from where he is, he has brought forth the truth. The end time church will know him. The end time church will have a personal, intimate fellowship with him. And then we come down to verse 37, where he says, that the last great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, if any man thirst, Come, be coming unto me, as we said, and be drinking. And then he goes on and says, He that is believing on me. And who is one who is believing on him? Not just one who mentally assents to it, but one who is hearing and doing the word. We taught a session, a whole series on believing some time back, and showed forth that real believing is hearing and doing the word, acting upon it, not just mentally assenting to it. He who is continually believing, as Young's brings out in me, as the scripture has said, what's that mean? This guy's got the word in him. He's hearing and doing the word. He has a personal, intimate fellowship with the Lord. He is taught by the Lord. He knows the word. That's the guy, and he's doing it, and he is believing continually. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, because what's in him? 
The Word is in him. The Word is in him in abundance. And that is what is the key to see the flow of the rivers of living water coming out of the church in these last days. As he's talking about, this is the Holy Spirit operating. He operates through the rivers of living water that are in us that will flow out of us. And that is important to understand. Actually, the seventh month, which is the last month in the, uh, the uh, seasons of the feast, there's three feast seasons, the first month, the third month, and then the seventh month. The first month was the first coming of Jesus. The third month was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the beginning of the church age. And the seventh month is the second coming of Jesus. And this particular month was called, prior to the time of the captivity, it was not called Tishri. The seventh month was called Ethanim. 1 Kings 8, verse 2, All the men of Israel assembled themselves in the king's solemn at the feast in the month Ethanim. This is the seventh month, as it says, which is the seventh month. And this word, Ethanim, when you look it up, it, they say enduring here, but it has more understanding than that. It means living streams flowing. Living streams flowing. Meaning, the seventh month fulfillment of the work of God in the church will bring the church to maturity, to perfection, to the place of being filled with the Word of God for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the rivers of living water flowing forth. The living streams flowing forth. Say, when did it change? They changed it after they got into captivity. And they got away from the things of the Word of God. They went into captivity, of course, because they were walking wrong. And they changed it to Tishri. They changed the way their years are. Remember, God's year is on the lunar calendar. And the Word of God makes the first month at the time of what we would consider March or April. Well, the Jews, they changed it. And they, have, they got rid of the civil year. And then they have, they have their year that they start at the time in October and go on like their agricultural year. But this year is the seventh month. This is God's consideration of it. And this month is called the living streams flowing forth. The church is going to enter into the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, and they're going to see the manifestation of the rivers of living water coming out of the church in the last days. We see a scripture that's also prophetic regarding things that will happen in the end times in Deuteronomy 23, 14. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp. The camp is a type of the church. And he's coming and walking in the church today to find out who is going to walk in line with the word, who's going to do what he says and follow him, and who isn't. And notice what he comes to do. He comes to deliver thee, to give up thine enemies before thee. The Lord is coming to all that will listen to bring deliverance. Deliverance from sin, deliverance from the works of the flesh, deliverance from the world, deliverance from all the evil spirits as we cast them out. He wants us delivered from everything that is evil. Now, look what he says then. Therefore shall thy camp be holy. The church is to be holy. He is going to manifest himself in a holy church. Jesus is going to present a holy church unto him. And notice that he see no unclean thing in thee. When you put the cursor over the word unclean, it's actually the word erva in the Hebrew, which means nakedness. Notice it below here. And we can even show you through the usage. Look at the usage down here. Fifty-four times this word is used in the Hebrew. 50 times, plus one other one with another word attached, 51 of the times it's translated nakedness. That's really what it means. If you're naked, that means you're not clothed. And if you haven't been clothed, that means what's on you is uncleanness because you haven't gotten rid of the uncleanness and replaced it with God's clothes, the garments of God. God he wants us to get clothed. Jesus is walking in the church to deliver it, to restore it, to bring it to the place of being holy, and it must not have anything that is unclean or causing them to be naked, which is because they haven't put on the garments of God, the spiritual clothes, 
which is done through the Word of God. Notice, if he sees any nakedness in you, mean that you didn't clothe yourselves with the garments of God, but you still have uncleanness in you, he's going to turn away. Well, that means he's not going to manifest himself. If he doesn't see that you and I put the garments of God on, which is the Word, in us and walking in it, he's going to turn away from us. You and I are responsible to clothe ourselves with the garments of God. If you are going to be having the rivers of living water in you to flow out of you, you've got to put on the garments of God. And what are you going to, how do you do this? Several scriptures in the New Testament make this very clear. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on. This is the Greek word enduo. You notice in the lower window it means to sink into clothing or to clothe oneself. Every one of these ones that you see that with scriptures we're going to bring up to you, you will see that they're in the middle voice. The tense voice and mood are extremely important in the Greek, and we, of course, take the time to explain it to you clearly. The voice in the Greek has three voices. Active, meaning the subject is doing the action. Passive, meaning the subject is being acted upon by somebody else. When you see a middle voice, it means the subject is doing the action for his benefit, and he is to do it to see that benefit come to pass. Therefore, this says that you and I are to put on or to clothe ourselves for our own benefit the whole armor of God, and it's a command. And the way you do it is through the Word, the Word in your heart, the Word in your mind, the Word in your mouth, the Word directing your steps. It's the Word in you in every aspect. God wants the Word in you. We see in verse 14, when he talks about having your loins girt with the truth, that's the Word. And having on, this Word is the same Word, and duo, ha having clothed yourself, same thing, middle voice, having clothed yourself with the breastplate of righteousness. That's the Word of righteousness in you that you're walking in, and you're showing forth the fruits of righteousness. We also see, if you are going to put on the garments of God in order to be that church that has the rivers of living water within them, Romans 13, 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. You've got to get rid of everything that's not of God. And let us put on Again, the word and duo, the armor of light. And again, this is the middle voice. And in this case, it is a subjunctive mood, meaning that you and I, that we must, we might put on the armor of light, meaning it's all conditional upon you doing it. It's not automatic, meaning you don't have that on when you get born again. You've got to put it on. And it'll only be put on if you meet the condition of doing it. And what's the light? The Word. How do I put on the armor of light? I have the Word in me. The Word of God is to be in you. And then we see in verse 14, also, as you are putting on the garments of God, you are actually putting the Lord on you. You put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Same word in duo. Same thing. Command. Middle voice. Imperative mood. You and I are commanded to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That means you're going to become like Him. You could put Him on for yourself. And make not provision, or this means forethought, for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. That means you can't be walking in the lust of the flesh. You're going to be contaminated because the flesh has sin. You must not make forethought for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. We must turn away from that. What else must we do? We saw that we're to put off some things. We do the same thing down here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Put off concerning the former manner of life, conduct, and behavior is what this word means, conversation. It doesn't mean just talk. It's overall manner of life, behavior, and conduct. You put off concerning the former behavior, the old man. Everything of the old, it's gone. We get rid of it. We don't walk after it anymore. It's corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, renewed in the spirit, 
through the Word of God that comes into you in your mind, you get a spiritual mind, and that you put on, this is this word in duo again, the new man, again, middle voice, you put on for yourself the new man, which after God is created in righteous and true holiness. You put on the new man through your mind being renewed to the word of God. We see it brought out as well over in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. If we go back to verse 8, it tells us, put off all these. And this is all the old man stuff. This is all the deceit according to the lust. This is the things that you should not have in your life. Put off all these. Anger. If you have anger, you're operating in the flesh. You're not going to have any rivers of living water if you're getting angry. Wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. They all need to be eliminated. Lying. Lie not to one to another. Liars end up in the lake of fire, you know. You can't be lying whatsoever. Seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. These are all deeds of the old man that are sin that will take you down a path of destruction. You must cease these things. And have put on, again, a duo, clothing yourself, same thing, middle voice, for your own benefit, the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. Renewed in knowledge, precise, correct knowledge, accurate knowledge. You've got to know. This word knowledge, epigenosis, means precise, correct knowledge. Not what I think it says. You've got to know it exactly. God expects us to know the word exactly because we spend the time and study and we know exactly what it says. You're going to be renewed in knowledge. That is critical. You'll never have the, the, the rivers of living water coming out of you if you haven't gotten your mind renewed to the truth of the word of God. And then he comes down to verse 12. Put on, therefore, that means clothe yourself in duo. This is what you must do. Imperative mood. This is a command, remember. And again, the middle voice, as we mentioned, in every case of the we're giving you, put on as the chosen of God, the elect or chosen of God. This shows you're chosen. If you do this, if you don't do it, <laughs> what are you doing in your life? We should be, have put this on. Put on, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. Kindness. God wants kindness. There shouldn't be any meanness or rudeness or, you know, harshness. Humbleness of mind, humility, meekness, gentleness, mildness. This is all mandatory in your life. Commands. Long-suffering. That's what he wants for us. Forbearing, that means holding up one another, not tearing somebody down. Forgiving one another. You can't hold grudges and hold unforgiveness against people and think you're right or not. If any man have a quarrel against any, you forgive him. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on charity. This is agape love. The love that realizes the valuableness, the preciousness, and the worth of every individual. And it is unconditional love without reservation. You walk in love, period, including all of your enemies, which is the bond of perfectness, that which binds you into perfection. Binds you into, binding you together into perfection. We're going on to perfection. These things are critical for you, to clothe yourselves with these things, the garments of God. If we remember, if he finds us to be naked, that we haven't clothed ourselves, he's going to turn away. He's not going to manifest himself in those that are not walking right. We see in Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you and duo clothe yourself, middle voice, that you might clothe yourself, subjunctive mood, if you meet the conditions, with power from on high. Remember, you're supposed to get the power of God resident in you, which is what you do as you're putting on the armor of God through the Word in you. It produces the power of God in your life. But we also see how important this is. Matthew 22, he talks about the wedding. He uh, talks about the wedding of the church to Jesus the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden or called were not worthy. Remember, many are called, but only few are chosen. 
Why? Because they weren't worthy. You're not going to be chosen automatically just because you're born again. You're going to be chosen because you were found worthy. Go therefore on the highways, find him, bid him to the marriage, he goes on. So he goes and finds them, bad and good, so they can be changed. When the king came in to see the guests, because when you get invited, God's going to do a work in you to get you ready for the marriage. What do he see? He comes in to see the guests, and he sees there's a man which had not on and duo, had not clothed himself, middle voice. And this is an interesting one also because it's a perfect tense verb. And again, if you haven't heard us talk a lot about this, this is extremely important, and we'll explain it all to you. Don't check out when we talk about this. Stay tuned in. Perfect tense means action completed in the past with present results of the time of speaking. Meaning, this man had not in the past, with the present results now, put on this wedding garment, which is clean and white and holy. That meant he hadn't been doing what he was supposed to do. He hadn't been in the Word and doing all the things in the past with the, continually working his life with the present effects of that now. What has this guy been doing in his life? He hasn't been doing the right thing. What about this guy? He said, friend, how camest thou in not having a wedding garment? He was speechless. What happened to that guy? Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's not saved, is he? He's finished. Why? Because he didn't have a wedding garment on. He didn't get himself clothed like he was supposed to, and put on the things of holiness. You see, this is critical for every one of us. Revelation 19 I wants you to notice. This is when Jesus comes back. And when Jesus comes back, we're talking about after he's come and caught us up to meet the Lord in the air. This is when we're coming back with him after the marriage supper of the Lamb. And notice, he's coming with a white horse. He's faithful and true and righteous. He's coming to judge and make war against the nations. I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness did he judge and make war. And who's coming with him? It speaks more about it. It's a flame of fire, many crowns, her name written. And he comes, he's clothed with a vesture, vesture dipped in blood, his name's called the Word of God, so it clearly is talking about Jesus. And notice who's coming with him. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Well, who's that? That's the church. Have clothed, and duo, having clothed themselves, middle voice, perfect tense, in the past with present results. Otherwise, they did the work of clothing themselves. They did the work of hearing and doing the word. They did the work of seeing themselves come into being, known, being like the Lord, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and coming to the place of perfection and holiness before God. These ones have clothed themselves with the present results. That's why they're in this group. With fine linen, and what's the linen? Linen speaks of righteousness, white and clean. White, brilliant, clean, having been cleansed. In fact, even if we go back to Revelation 17, 14, these are they that make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. He's the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and they that are with him, which are who? The church. Who are they? They're the called, they're the chosen, and they're the faithful. Aha. That means these ones that are called have been chosen, and they have shown themselves to be faithful. That is what God wants. In fact, if we would have read on a little bit farther, which we'll go back and take a look at, remember when we saw this? Matthew 22, 11, the guy did not put on his wedding garment, and he gets thrown out. We didn't read the next verse, verse 14. For many are called, but few are chosen. 
Only the ones who put on the wedding garment will be chosen. Even the rest of them who've been called, they won't be chosen. The ones who come with him are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. God is going to bring forth the holy church, the manifest Lord Jesus Christ, put in, having put on the Lord Jesus Christ that's come to perfection in the Lord. He's going to bring this forth. In fact, we even see this really spoken of over in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. These are the true ones, not the false ones. What are they to be doing? For the perfecting of the saints. Where to go on, where to get perfected, see? For the work of the ministry, we all have a ministry to carry out, for the edifying of the body of Christ, the building up. God wants every one of us build up and become strong and doing the work of the Lord. Perfected. Till we all come, this is the will of God for everybody, unfortunately only a remnant's listening, who all come in the unity of the faith and of the precise, correct knowledge, again, epigenosis, of the Son of God, unto what? The perfect man. The man who's been brought to perfection, the finished work accomplished. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the work done. That's the mature church. That is the holy church. Well, what's going to happen as you get these clothes on, and now you've been drinking continually. You've been taking the word of God in you. You've got these rivers of living water have come into you. Now, when he talked about out of the belly will flow these rivers of living water, it really goes back to a prophecy in Ezekiel of what was going to happen. And he's speaking of it in John 7 about that it is going to be fulfilled in the end time church that is going to have these rivers of living water coming out of it. But let's look at Ezekiel's prophecy in Ezekiel 47. Afterward, he brought me again into the door of the house. You and I are the spiritual house of God now. Remember, this is Ezekiel's temple. We're talking about you and I are the temple now. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house. There's waters coming out from this house. Eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east. The waters came down the side from under the right side of the house at the south side. So it's coming from the east. It's coming from the south. These waters are coming out of it. He brought me out of the way of the gate northward, led me toward about the way without unto the utter gate by the way looking eastward. And there ran out waters on the right side. It's coming out the left side, the south side. Now it's coming out the right side. When the men, otherwise it's coming out of the house from every direction. When the man had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits and he brought me through the waters and the waters were to the ankles. Aha. That means the waters were rising in this house. It's up to the ankles now. And he measured a thousand, brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. They're getting higher. And he measured a thousand, brought me through the waters, were to the loins. And then he measured a thousand. It was a river that I could not pass over. The waters had engulfed the whole house. You and I are the house of God. And the waters are to engulf us. That's the word of God coming into us. We put on everything what God wants. He wants the word in you, the waters coming into you. Notice, it's a river that I could not pass over. The waters are risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. God is bringing this forth. He said, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river, there were many trees on the one side on the other. You and I are called trees of righteousness. And trees grow best by what? By the river, by the water, because they're soaking up that water, causing them to grow, be strong. And so all the trees, the type of you and I that are sitting there drinking of the water, these waters issue out toward the east country, go down the desert, go to the sea, waters will be healed. Were these waters, it's causing all this to happen. Verse 9, it shall come to pass that everything that liveth which moveth, whithersoever the rivers, rivers shall come, the rivers coming out from the house, 
which is the rivers of living water coming out from the church. Wherever they're going to come, everything's going to live because it's going to release God's life. The river of God is to come out of you. There shall be a very great multitude of fish. Oh, that's that speak up. People that are going to be one to the Lord. A tremendous ingathering of people coming to the Lord in these last days. God does not want the billions of people that have rejected Jesus to go to hell. He wants them to be saved. And there will be, even when all these things are happening, which we'll cover in a minute, there's going to be a tremendous move of the, of the, in the body of Christ, the glorious church, with the rivers of living water flowing out of it. There should be a great, very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whether the river cometh. It's going to bring healing. It's going to bring miraculous works. It's going to bring people to be saved. It shall come to pass, the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi unto Engliam, and they shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. Tremendous harvest of souls that is declared. The miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to Saul. Now those are the ones that aren't, aren't, aren't by the river. God wants us to be ones planted by the river, remember, rivers of living water. And by the river, upon the bank thereof, on this side, on that side, grow all trees for me, whose leaf shall not fade, we're not going to fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed, they will bring forth new fruit according to his months, because there are waters they issued out of the sanctuary. And what's the sanctuary? The holy place. This is coming out of the holy church. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. It brings healing, brings feeding. The water, living waters are going to come forth. It's going to come in the church before the end comes. Psalms 46. Psalms 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. This is, you need to know he's your strength, he's your refuge, he will help you because when the bad stuff comes, when the judgments begin to pour out, pour, be poured out, you got to be abiding in him. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed. The word removed literally means be changed, be altered. It's exactly what's going to happen. When the judgments come, it's going to make havoc of the entire earth. We're talking about when Jesus comes back and begins to bring these judgments coming. We will not fear, showing we're here, we haven't left, though the earth be changed and being altered. It's actually in the Hephil stem. There's different stems in the Hebrew. And the Hephil stem, you can see right here, means change or alter. So though the earth is being changed and altered because of all the judgments that are coming, I mean, every mountain's going to be out of place. I mean, there's going to be havoc everywhere. As the judgments are coming upon the nations, they're being, they're being going crazy, the people will be. Though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea. That's like volcanoes and earthquakes occurring. Nothing like what you see now. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, be in an uproar, absolute uproar going on. We know that's going to happen. Though the mountains shake, quake, these are earthquakes, with the swelling thereof, the rising earthquakes that are going to rise up as it speaks of. And we know all these things are going to happen. In fact, it's even prophesied in Luke, in the end time chapter in Luke 21, down in verse 25. There'll be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, upon the earth, distress of nations, perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. They'll be roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Everything is going to be shaken. We go back to Psalms. In the midst of this, when all these things begin to break forth, 
We are in verse 3. There is a river. There'll be a river. And who's that? That's the church that has the river of God in it. The river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. And it says, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High, which tells you when this is going to manifest. It's going to happen at the end of the church age, which is the time of the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, when the church has come to perfection, and this has all been accomplished. The streams, this river, and this river is the church. It's the city of God is the church where God is inhabiting and manifesting himself. The holy place of the tabernacle, him manifesting of the Most High God. And you know that's so because the next verse makes it very clear. God is in the midst of her. Well, that's the city. God is in the midst of her, in the church. She shall not be moved. She's not going to be moved. She's not going to be shaken by the things that happen. God shall help her. He will be there. And that right early. And it's very interesting what it says when it says right early. The word early here means at the break of day, at the very beginning of the day, or when the morning appears. And when does all this happen? It happens at the beginning of the seventh day when Jesus begins to rule and reign from heaven. This is talking about the beginning of the seventh day when all these things begin to come down on the earth. The same time, the heathen rage. These are the nations. They're going to be raging because they see the judgments are starting to come. But they still won't repent, as it talks about in Revelation. <laughs> but kingdoms were being shaped, moved. This means shaken. They've been shaken. In fact, this particular one means they've been shaken, tottering, slipping. They're going to be overthrown. They're going to be destroyed. He uttered his voice, and the earth melts. Be tremendous things that are going to happen. The kingdoms, everything's going to be moved. But he goes on and says, the Lord of hosts is with us. You are abiding in him. He'll be with us. He'll protect us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. He is our high place of refuge and fortress, our one protecting us. When he speaks of the Lord of hosts. This is the covenant-keeping name of the Lord, by the way. He keeps covenant promises. They don't stop during the tribulation period. No, not at all. Come, behold the works of the Lord and what desolations he's made in the earth. Judgments are going to come. There's going to be tremendous desolation that is going to occur at that time. He makes the wars to cease. This is when he comes after he's destroyed them all. Under the end of the earth, he breaks the bow, cuts the spear in asunder, he burns the chariot with fire. There's not going to be any war in the millennial reign of Jesus. This is speaking of the time of the millennial reign of Jesus when it kicks in, after he's done the destruction of the desolations. And then he says to you and me, be still, be quiet, and know that I'm God. Don't get upset. Don't get fearful. Don't get nervous. Be quiet. Be still. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, our secure place, our defense, our place of refuge. When's all this happening? Well, remember, the river comes when the fulfillment of the work of God in the church is done to bring it to maturity, to bring it to the place of, of perfection and fruitfulness. It occurs at the end of the church age, as God is in the midst of the church, and the church is not going to be moved. God's going to help her at the beginning of the seventh day when the judgments are being poured out. The six days is the days of man. The last two days, of four days unto Christ, the 4,000 years of man. Two days, the 2,000 years of the church age, 6,000 years, that's the six days. Remember, the church age is not over yet. When's it over? 2030 A.D. How do we know? It started in 30 A.D. That's when Jesus brought forth the beginning of the church age. That's when he went to the cross, was raised from the dead. 
2030, that's 12 years away. You see things getting worse and worse in the world, and they're going to get worse and worse in the world. Everything is going to be shaken that's going to be shaken, but this is the time for you to get yourself full of the river of God. It's time for you to get strong and mighty and get yourself in the Word. And if you're dabbling in the things of the world, or you're dabbling in things that you know you shouldn't be doing, get out of them. It's time for you to put in first place and get right. Clean up our act. Clean up your act in your life. Remember, if he sees any nakedness in you, he'll turn away from you. He's not going to manifest himself in that which is not right whatsoever. It's not going to happen. The nations will be enraged as the judgments are occurring. They're going to be going absolutely crazy in the midst of all of these things. John chapter 2. In the third day, there was a marriage in Cana. What's the third day? That's the day after the two days of the church age. The church age, 2,000 years, the two days. In fact, we'll come back to this in a minute. Let's show you the two days it speaks of. Hosea. Chapter 6, verse 2. He says, first of all, come, let us return to the Lord. He hath torn, he'll heal us, he has smitten, he has bind us up. God wants everybody to repent, return to him, get right 100%, period. That's it. After two days, that's the church age, he will revive us. In the third day, he'll raise us up and we will live in his sight. And we'll know if we go follow on to know the Lord is going forth and prepared as the morning. He's going to come unto as the rain, the latter and the former rain. That's the double portion rain to bring forth the maturity. Rain brings maturity of the crops. To bring the church to perfection, which is the teaching of righteousness, the teaching of the word of God coming unto us. He's going to raise up this mighty, great end time church is going to come forth. And the third day, this is the beginning of the time, there at the third day, the marriage in Cana. Well, who is that a type of? A marriage between Jesus and the church when we're caught up to meet him in the Lord in the air. The mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus was called and his disciples. Who's going to be at this marriage? Jesus will be there. Who else? Every believer that's born again? Nope. Only the disciples to the marriage. Who are the disciples? The disciplined ones. Who is a disciple from God's standpoint? We'll come back here in a moment. John 8, 31. Then said Jesus to, Jesus to those Jews that believed on him, If you continue in my word, that's the condition, remain and abide in the word. Then are you my disciples, disciplined ones, indeed. You're a hearer and a doer of the word consistently. You're disciplined. And, of course, that's the guy who's going to see, know the truth, and the truth's going to make him free. What else shows that you are a disciple? John 15, 8. Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. And, of course, how did you get to this place? You didn't get much fruit overnight. No. Verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. The fruit comes from the Word in your life. Every branch that bears fruit, you're starting to bear fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. What's the purging? Cleansing. There has to be a cleansing of all of the filth to bring forth more fruit. That means all the sin has to be eliminated. All of it. Then you bring more fruit. More fruit. Then he says, this is misleading unless you understand what it says in the Greek, which we'll point out to you. Now you're clean through the word that I've spoken to you. People say, oh, the word, I've heard it, so it's cleansed me. That's not what it's saying. You are clean. The word through is the word dia in the Greek. And you must understand that dia means through when it's in the genitive, but if it's the accusative case, it means because of. That's important to understand. I can even show it to you right here. Here's the word dia. 
I'm putting the cursor over this word right here if you see it. It means, in the genitive, it means through. But with the accusative, that's the ACC, that's a, one of the cases, there's five cases in, in there, in the Greek, and the accusative, it means because of. How do you know what the case is? You look at what it's, mod what, mod what it's modifying. Here's the word, it's the accusative, the, and this is the word, which is also accusative. So what does that mean? It shouldn't be translated through, it should be translated because of. So that's a big deal, difference. Not just through the word that it was spoken to me, but because of the word that was spoken to me. Meaning the word did something in me, but also there's another important thing here. Not the word that I spoken to me, you know, that, that I didn't do anything with. The word spoken is also very important to look at because this is a perfect tense verb, active voice. The perfect tense in the Greek means action completed in the past with present results at the time of speaking, which means the word that has been spoken to you in the past that has present effects at the time of speaking, which implies what? You are hearing and doing it, hearing and doing it, incorporated into your life, and it has the effect in your life right now. In other words, you're clean because of the word that you've heard in the past that you took hold of and did and walked in it continually and saw the results of it. Well, that's what it's talking about. Not just because you heard it at one point. It's because you, what you did with the word. That is what God wants in our life. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except that abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. So we go from the fruit stage through the cleansing process to the more fruit stage. And the cleansing process has occurred because of the word that we have heard in the past and been hearing, doing, have incorporated into our life. So it's caused the great work of cleansing in our life. And we come to the abiding place of continuing in the word. That's how we come to much fruit. That, as we see, is the guy who is the disciple. The guy who bears much fruit is the disciple. So, who's going to be at the marriage? Every born-again believer? No. Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. The disciples are going to be there. The ones who are here as endures and have been walking in the ways of the Lord. That's the remnant. And they wanted wine. The mother of Jesus said we have, they have no wine. Wine speaks of fruitfulness. Just, Jesus said to her, Woman, what I have to do with thee, mine hour is not yet come. What's he talking about? He's talking about his hour when the fruitfulness comes in the end time body of Christ, the work of God being done, the perfected church for the marriage that's going to be presented unto him, the holy church. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now what did he do? There were set six water pots of stone. Water pots. After the man of the purifying of the Jews, meaning that this water was for the purifying. The water is the word of God, a type of. Fill the water pots with water. Fill them up to the brim. Who is a water pot? You and I. Because remember it said there were six of them. Six is the number of man. Six water pots is referring to man is supposed to be, everybody's supposed to be fill, filled with water. What water? The water of the word of God. And you're to be filled to the brim, to the top. Well, what would that make you? If you're, are you with this, the ankles or the loins or the knees or the loins? If you're filled to the top, what would that make you? A river, remember? You're now become a river if you're filled with the water of the word of God. Draw it out now, bear it in the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And the ruler feasted, and tasted the water that was made wine, knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, said, Every man at the beginning has set forth good wine. When men have well drunk, now that which is, which, that which is worse. 
but thou hast kept the good wine until now. The water from the filling of the word in you turns to fruitfulness. Wine speaks of fruitfulness, meaning that the word of God has become fruitful in you because you got filled up. You became a river with the water of God in you. In fact, it's interesting when it says the water that has made wine is not, a, it kind of makes you lose something here because the word is not made. The word is ginamai, which means become. If something's made, it's just converted into, it could be at a moment's time or whatever, but become indicates a process. And furthermore, this again is a perfect tense verb. What's that mean? That means the action was completed in the past with present effects now. That means this just wasn't an instant becoming, revelation, what it's talking about. It's talking about what was becoming from all this work in the past that has present effects now. Meaning the water that was in you that gets filled up, which is the word of God in you, if you've been hearing and doing it in the past and continually, it becomes fruitfulness because you bring forth fruit, more fruit, much fruit in your life. The fruitfulness is coming forth. That's what God wants. You've got to get filled up with the water of the Word of God. Every man at the beginning set forth the good wine, men of well drunk than that which is worse, but you kept the good wine until now. That's the best wine. And what's the best fruitfulness? It's going to be in the end time, glorious, mature, perfected church that is going to come to perfection and walk in holiness and walk in the glory. Remember, the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the former. It'll be greater in the end time church. And why will that be? Because of the word of God that has come forth in this end time church. And what was he doing? The beginning of miracles did Jesus and Cain and Galilee and manifested forth his glory. What's going to happen in the church that becomes the water fills you up and you become fruitful and you have gone into perfection, become that glorious church? The glory of God is going to be poured out on the end time <laughs> church and it is going to be powerful, mighty. It's going to happen. If you are in the river, means you are in God. If the river is of God, is a river's in you, then God is in you through the word. If you're drinking from the river, that means you've been drinking from God, which is what? Drinking the word of God. If you release the river to flow out of you, that means you're releasing God. How do you release him? Through the word. Acting on the word, speaking the word, doing the word, praying the word using your authority, acting on the word to conquer the enemies and to destroy all of their works. God is going to do a mighty work in the body of Christ. It's going to happen. John brings a lot of this out. John chapter 4, verse 7. Here's a woman of Samaria coming to draw water and Jesus says, give me to drink. She says, you're asking me, you must, must have any dealings with the Samaritans. Samaritans. Jesus said, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus is going to give us living water. And she says, I have nothing to draw with. The well's deep. Whence hast thou that living water? And then he comes and Jesus says, verse 13, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. The natural water. But whosoever might drink, this is because this is a subjunctive mood verb, who might drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Might never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water. And what's this well of water going to do? It's going to spring up into everlasting life. This is a river of water, living water on the inside of you. And the living waters are supposed to be flowing out of you. 
having come into you. You've got to get the water in you. When this well of water is in you, it's going to spring up into everlasting life. And the water's flowing out of you is going to minister life to everything that you come in contact with. That's only if you're filled up with the water. If you're not filled up to the brim with the water, what are you doing with your life? Oh, yeah, I must be involved in all these worldly things, a uh, bunch of fleshly things, a bunch of fun things, uh, uh, watching things I have no business to watch, all these kind of things. There's trouble. God's calling every one of us to get tuned in as the remnant and follow him 100%. You're bought with a price. Seek the things above, not the things on the earth. John chapter 5, there's a feast of the Jews, and the Jews, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. At Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool was called in the three, three Hebrew tongue Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy or flowing water. Aha. When the water's flowing, the mercy of God is flowing. That's what it means. The flowing of waters, the release of mercy, and what does it bring? It brings healing, it brings deliverance, it brings life, it brings victory. The mighty works of God being done. A oh, great multitude, impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. They're waiting for this moving of the water, this water to get flowing, to set in motion, the moving of it. The setting in motion of the water is going to release the healing. That's what they're waiting for. Angel went down a certain season into the pool, troubled the water. Whosoever first, then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. That tells you something. The moving of the water brought healing. The setting in motion of the water brought healing. That's what God wants. The setting of the water in motion from the living waters coming into the church, flowing forth, are going to bring a mighty healing to the world that will receive Jesus in the end times. There will be a glorious, mighty church. God is going to do great and mighty things. We see one other thing we're going to look at with a couple other scriptures too. 1 Samuel 17. This is David against Goliath. He'd already proved God with a lion and the bear. He'd already knew he was an uncircumcised Philistine. He had a covenant with God. He proved it. He'd already seen the promises of God coming to pass and smiting and overcoming enemies. And he knew he could take this guy out because he's an uncircumcised Philistine. He doesn't have a covenant with God. So what's he do? He took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones out of the brook, which just means out of the river, the torrent. The, the. So, five smooth stones come out of the water. How do the stones get smooth? When the, you see them in the brook, the water runs over them and runs over them and runs over them and runs over them and runs over them for a long time. It gets rid of all the imperfections. It gets rid of all the things that need to be removed to make that thing smooth. The water working in you day after day after day, week after week, month after month, even year after year, hearing and doing and hearing and doing will make you like a smooth stone. And he took the five smooth stones, put them in the shepherd's bag. And that's, that's what God wants for you. you he's, he's obviously, he's a shepherd. Or he's a, he's, uh, he's a shepherd and he's under the, the, under the real shepherd. He's out there with the sheep. Speaks of the fact that he's been following, a type of him following up to the Lord. It says a sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. And then he swings, sends these stones after him. That's what he shot him with, remember? He sends forth the stone. So he smote the enemy and wiped them out, smite, smites them, as we see. Here's when he put the hand in his bag, took the stones, slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead. So the smooth stone is what you have to have if you're going to be able to be effective in warfare. 
And so how are you going to get the smooth stone? It's coming out of the water. How are you going to get that? You've got to be in the Word. You are a stone. You're a living stone, remember, in the house of God. And you as living stones are to become smooth stones, having the work of God been accomplished through the water that keeps washing over it for year, years and years, even in your life. So this speaks of much water of the Word, the life of a believer, to make you smooth stones. And that's what you're going to use to smite the enemy because you have come to perfection. You have come to be one who has no imperfections whatsoever. And what did they do? Also, five is the number of grace. The grace of God will be manifested in those who are like smooth stones. Acts chapter 4. After these guys had a prayer meeting, and it says that great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection and great grace was upon them. The favor of God and power operated. And what happened with these guys? This is the remnant. Down in Acts chapter 5, verse 12, by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And there were all with one accord in Solomon's port. Solomon's port speaks of Solomon's temple, which is the church, the end time church, Solomon's temple is a type of the end time church, the temple of the Lord. And they're in one accord, meaning there's going to be a remnant that's going to be in one accord because we're all going to become in one accord with him in line with the word and be the holy, glorious church. Remember, Jesus prayed that we would be one and then the glory is poured out on those who are the one. So these are the ones that are going to see the glory of God manifest. I want you to notice this verse. And of the rest, the ones that weren't one, these guys were outside of that. Of the rest, durst no man join himself to them. They wouldn't join himself to them. That means there's going to be a bunch of people who aren't going to join themselves to the remnant. They're not going to clean themselves up. They're not going to get, become holy. They're not going to see the glory of God manifest in them. Because what happened with these other guys? The believers were more added to the Lord. Multitudes, that's the fish, the great amount of fish both men and women. Insomuch they brought the sick in the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter, Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. They came a multitude out of the cities round about into Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Wherever that river goes, everything will be healed. Life will come. But if you don't have the river in you, it'll never happen. You got to get the river in you. So the question for every one of us is, how much water is in you? Have the water got up to your ankles yet? Have the waters been rising in you? Have you kept the water in you, which is the word, or is the devil come and taking it out? We'll be looking at this later when we talk about tonight, but it talks about how the Philistines came and stopped up the wells of water. <laughs> That's the devil coming to stop up the wells of water and cut off the water if you're operating in your life. You can't give place to the devil and let him do that to you. You're to be a well of water. You're to be springing up out of you, rivers of living water to come out of you. How full of water are you? You've got to become a river. It's time to put the Word of God first place. Get rid of all the rest of the stuff. Hear and do the word, hear and do the word, walk in the word, carry it out. God will do a great work. And you're going to see fruitfulness come forth in your life. It's going to be a day in and day out process. Ongoing, continually. He's going to change you, he's going to heal you, he's going to transform you. And you've got to get rid of all this sinful stuff. All this old man stuff, all this anger, and all this stuff, lying, bitterness, resentment, all this stuff out of here. You'll never be a part of the remnant because the remnant will be a holy church. One last scripture. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 and 27. This is talking about Christ here that he might sanctify and cleanse it which is the church with the washing of water by the word. 
that he might sanctify it. That's the main verb here. And it's subjunctive mood, meaning that it's not a guaranteed deal. Remember, the subjunctive mood is conditional upon conditions being met, meaning you have to do what's necessary to see the sanctification come to pass. It's not automatic. You've got to work out your own salvation, become holy, and do all these things. That you might sanctify it. Having, as Jung says, cleansed it with the bathing of the word. Otherwise, when we look at this word, or cleanse here, the King James just really messes this up because it's a participle here, cleansed. This is why Young's translates it, that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it with the bathing, or the, this is Lutron, bathing of the water of the word. We're not talking about just a little bit of water, the bathing. I mean, the water just runs over all of you. When you take a bath, you get, the water gets everywhere, doesn't it? That means the, the river is coming over you. The washing of the water by the word of God. The things that have been spoken unto you, that you've taken hold and done it. And what's that going to produce? The holy church. And what's he going to do with that? That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot, a wrinkle, or any such thing that it should be holy and without blemish. That is what Jesus is going to present unto himself. The Holy Church. That's what you and I are going to become as we are the remnant and we do everything that God says in his word. God will accomplish the great work. You have a part to play, which is doing what the word says. you got to become a river. Again, how much water is in you? Has it gotten above the ankles? Has it gotten up to the knees? If God could examine you in the spirit and look at you and say, hmm, where's the water? How come it's not all in you? We need to get a river in us. Get the river of God in you because the rivers of living water are to flow out of you and me in the end time church, the glorious church that is going to be raised up before the end. Praise God for the work he's going to do in your life. This is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit flows as a river of living waters from the Word being in you and the fruitfulness and His work accomplished in you and through you. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of the flowing of the rivers of living water coming out of the end time church. I thank you. I must become a river. I must get the water in me. It's got to fill my whole being. I'm a water pot. I got to get filled with water to the brim so I can be fruitful, so I can be ready for the marriage of, of the Lamb, so I can be a vessel, a holy vessel for the flowing forth of the rivers of living water out of me that will bring forth a great harvest of souls, healing, every place, the water flows, everything will live. I thank you for the great work you're going to do in my life because I'm getting my life in order. I'm getting the water in me. I'm filling this water pot to the brim. I will be a river. I thank you for operating in me mightily. So the rivers of living water will flow forth out of me. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, I thank you that every single Christian that hears this has ears to hear of the importance of this message regarding the work that they must do to see this be accomplished in them in the end time church. Thank you that we will be hearers and doers of this word. In Jesus' name, amen.